For those of you who I haven't met, I'm Jim Staros, and it is my privilege to serve uh, UMass Amherst as Provost and Senior Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs. Welcome all to this uh, second Distinguished Faculty Lecture of this academic year. As we approach our assessment centennial, it's worth noting that for almost 40 of those 150 years, this lecture series has played an important role in recognizing our most esteemed and accomplished faculty members. Uh, before we get farther into the proceedings, please take a moment to turn off uh, or silence at minimum uh, your cell phones and any other electronic devices that might be or ring. <coughs> Before we introduce uh, Professor Stephen Klingman, I'd like to take this opportunity to recognize the work of the selection committee and give you some background to the selection process for this distinguished faculty lecture series. Every year we invite deans, department heads and chairs, and individual faculty members to nominate college colleagues for participation in our distinguished faculty lecture series, recognizing their achievements and highlighting the scholarly activities and academic excellence of UMass Amherst. During the spring semester, a committee of faculty members reviews these nominations, and they have the difficult task of selecting just four faculty members to be honored during the upcoming academic year. This year's committee members are Wei Bil Gong and the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, Jaris Hansen, the Department of Communication, uh, Manisha Sinha, Department of Afro-American Studies, and Michael Williams, Department of Geosciences. Um, I don't know that they're all here with us today, but please join me in thanking them all for their service with this lecture series. Uh, this afternoon, Professor Stephen Klingman of the Department of English and the Director of the Interdisciplinary Studies Institute will present his lecture entitled, Looking from South Africa to the World, A Story of Identity for Our Times. South Africa has been recognized as a country where ethnic and racial history have been defined by division and oppression as well as by hope. Professor Klingman will discuss how Af South African writers and <coughs> activists have uh, uh, proceeded in the question of identity and the role it plays through a world that is troubled and divided and yet still connected. A native of South Africa, Professor Klingman has focused much of his career on what divides people and what might connect them across boundaries. After earning his doctorate from Oxford, uh, Professor Klingman joined the university's English department in 1989. Professor Klingman's contributions to UMass Amherst are both varied and impressive. Over the years, he has served as chair of the English department, head of the College of Humanities and Fine Arts Visioning Group, member of the Five College African Studies Council, and member of the executive committee of the African Scholars Program. One of his most significant contributions uh, is his founding of the College of Humanities and Fine Arts Interdisciplinary Seminar in Humanities and Arts, known by the cognoscenti as ISHA, for which he served as director from 2001 to 2012. It was the success of ISHA that led me to ask him to expand its scope to that of a campus-wide resource that has become the Interdisciplinary Studies Institute, and I appointed him as its founding director. Professor Klingman has won numerous national awards and honors. Among the most prominent is the Sunday Times Alan Payton Award, which Professor Klingman received for his biography of Bram Fisher, entitled Bram Fisher, Afrikaner Revolutionary. His work is regarded as the definitive account of the South African lawyer and political figure who led Nelson Mandela's defense at the Rivonia trial. His research on Bram Fisher has also earned him the University of Massachusetts <coughs> President's Award. Professor Klingman has authored numerous articles on South Africa. He recently committed, completed a commission piece entitled South African Literature in the 1980s for the Cambridge History of South African Literature. In addition to his academic works, he's written articles for newspapers, including the New York Times and the Boston Globe. Uh, we are delighted to have Professor Klingman here uh, to speak with us today. It is now my pleasure to invite Joe Bartolomeo, Chair of the Department of English, to formally introduce our distinguished faculty lecturer. 
first book, The Novels of Nadine Mortimer, History from the Inside, was first published in 1986 in both the UK and South Africa, with the second edition published in, 2000, in uh, 1992 in the United States and the UK. One reviewer called it the best critical work on the 1991 Nobel Prize winner available. Another, a brilliant, subtle, somber, and precise book in which every sentence is loaded with an intellectual anguish, reflecting, above all, an anxiety to be scrupulously true to his subject. A review in the Johannesburg Weekly Mail concludes that the study is remarkable both for his brilliant presentation of Gordimer's ideas and development as a writer, and for offering perhaps the most subtle and persuasive understanding of the relationship between literature and history to emerge from over a decade of literary research in Southern Africa. Professor Klingman subsequently edited and wrote the introduction for Gordimer's The Essential Gesture, Writing, Politics, and Places which has been published in translation in French, Swedish, Italian, Portuguese, and Chinese. Salman Rushdie's rave review in The Observer praises Klingman as Gordimer's editor and collaborator. And the review in the San Francisco Chronicle observes that Gordimer has been fortunate to have found an editor who understands her work as well as South African history and society. Following these successes, Professor Klingman published Brown Fisher, Afrikaner Revolutionary, a monumental combination of biography and cultural history that traces political, social, and cultural changes in South Africa over the past century while detailing the life of Bram Fisher, who led the legal defense of Nelson Mandela. In 1999, as the provost mentioned, this book won the most prestigious nonfiction award in South Africa. Sunday Times Alan Payton Award is the equivalent of our quotes of prize. Reviewers lauded the enormous care Klingman has given to this life, his meticulous research and writing, the subtlety and refinement with which he approaches his subject. One especially poetic review compares the book to a pro crowbar. With every chapter you read, you can almost hear how the old, heavy, and dusty panels of wood creak as they are pried away. More simply, but no less powerfully, another reviewer maintains that Klingman has given his fellow South Africans a slice of history to be deeply proud of. As a testament to the enduring value of this research, Klingman's papers related to Bram Fisher are now cataloged and available at the Bodleian Library in Oxford. Professor Klingman's most recent book, The Grammar of Identity, Transnational Fiction and the Nature of the Boundary was published in 2009 by Oxford University Press. This work is groundbreaking in arguing for a new way of conceiving the literary panel, looking across national and period classifications to see continuities in the works of authors not no normally grouped together. He makes a very persuasive case that such works constitute a new genre, one characterized by blurring of boundaries of time and space and by displacements of identity. A review in the Journal of Postcolonial Writing considers it an absorbing study and impressively and very topically a reaffirmation of the importance of literary reading. And a detailed review essay in contemporary literature judges it to be an undeniably elegant study, <coughs> one that invites us to recognize this elegance as proof its author's scholarly integrity, but also as a measure of the book's success in its quest for an alternative mode of inquiry that refuses to be ascetic or impersonal in order to define a warmer set of virtues for the critic of contemporary writing. As I hope this brief rehearsal of his work suggests, Professor Klingman has had an extraordinary scholarly career with more to come. Well, thank you, Joe. Thank you, Provost Steros. Um, can I leave now? You, know, <laughs> uh, um, you almost make me believe I deserve this, this honor. Um,
it, it really is a great honor. And I really want to thank everybody for coming out. It's uh, very moving to see everybody here. Um, new friends, old friends as well. Very nice. Thank you. Uh, I do want to thank the Chancellor and the Provost for hosting this lecture, uh, Dean Julie Hayes and former deans as well who are also in the audience. Uh, my nominators, Sabina Murray and Suzanne Daly and Arthur Kinney for his support as well. And also, I want to say members of my department where I felt at home for the last going on 24 years now. Uh, it's a very um, humbling experience to, to stand here, especially when I know that um, there are numbers of others in my department and beyond who also deserve awards such as this. Um, I want to thank uh, Professor Mzama Mangaliso for helping me with uh, some translation work for this, uh, for this talk, as well as my brother Paul Klingman who, who assisted me as well. Uh, and I want to thank Kathy Smirovsky, who did a, just a totally bang-up job organizing this whole thing and making it run so smoothly. Um, I'm going to dedicate this lecture um, in memory and in honor of Arthur Chaskelson, um, first president of the Constitutional Court of South Africa. Um, my wife Moira and I were um, got to know Arthur and his wife Lorraine extremely well, and Arthur passed away Saturday this last weekend. It was a Saturday, December the 28th, 1991, around 9 a.m., and I was making my way across Johannesburg in a car driven by the eminent South African lawyer, George Bezos. We were on our way to see Nelson Mandela. It was a hectic, even terrifying time when the future of South Africa hung in the balance. Mandela had been released from prison in February 1990, fist raised to the sky, speaking to thousands from the city hall balcony in Cape Town, images to be imprinted on the mind of anyone who witnessed them. Now the Cadessa negotiations were underway in which the future dispensation of the country would be settled, yet every day brought notice of new threats and outrages. On the extreme right, the racist Afrikaner Vyastan Pavirchen led by Eugene Te Blanche, staged rallies and attacks flaunting their Nazi insignia, quasi-Nazi insignia. In one of the more confusing symptoms of the time, Chief Mangasutu Butelezi's Inkata movement, fashioning itself in opposition to Mandela's African National Congress, seemed to be in alliance with the shadier forces of the South African state. Hostel dwellers, the main source of Inkata support in the urban areas of Johannesburg, undertook horrendous attacks on students and community members. And then there were the occult organs of the state itself, the so-called third force, neither police nor army, yet incorporating elements of both, whose main purpose appeared to be mayhem, disruption, and death. Out of this emerged the eventual peaceful settlement of 1994, still a miracle of sorts when one looks back on it, though none of it was easily foreseeable at the time. That morning, I was on my way to see Mandela on a different kind of mission, oriented more towards research than politics, though it had its political dimensions. I was working on a biography of Bram Fischer, the white Afrikaner lawyer who had led the defense of Mandela and the other accused at the Ravonia trial of 1964. It was in his culminating speech at the trial that Mandela had solemnly announced his willingness to die for the principles he had lived for and death sentences were a real possibility. Yet Fisher and other members of the defense team, among them George Bezos and Arthur Chaskelson, had won life sentences for the chief accused, an outcome which seemed and was a genuine triumph. It was through my connections with George and Arthur that I had come to Mandela, who was taking a few days respite while the Cadessa negotiations were in recess for, for the new year. A message had come to me late in the afternoon before, be ready to see him tonight. Then a second message, no, he wants to see you tomorrow. He wants to think about Fisher before he speaks to you. My journey across town with George had aspects of the clandestine. First to an apartment in one suburb, suburb where we were met by Mandela's minders, his young ANC bodyguards. Then in convoy behind them to a house in another suburb where we were ushered in. And then Mandela himself came into the room, greeted George as an old friend, and the interview began. There's much that could be said about this, and I've begun to describe it elsewhere. Certainly it was a day and an encounter to be remembered. 
here, however, I want to focus on one of the key exchanges for thinking about the South African story and its history of identity. In our discussion, Mandela went back in his mind to the 1940s when under the influence of Walter Sisulu and Anton Lamberti, he helped establish the ANC Youth League, the story later told so evocatively in his book, Long Walk to Freedom. The Youth Leaguers were a militant group within the ANC, its young Turks, so to speak, and Mandela himself was an ardent African nationalist. What that meant, among other things, was that he wanted nothing to do with whites or members of any of the other races in South Africa, even those who were themselves working for liberation. I posed the question, what did you want whites to do, those who were opposed to the government? He thought for a moment and responded, you know, we didn't think about that. Perhaps we should have. In and of itself, this told me something important, that Mandela was no ordinary politician. He was prepared to think carefully about questions and give serious answers. But his follow-up was equally significant. Mandela told me that it was through working with people such as Fisher, Joe Slovo, Yusuf Dadu, and numbers of others that he had come to change his mind. For there he saw people of other races who were willing to take the same risks as black South Africans, who were willing to put their lives and commitments on the line in the same way. It is my profound belief that it was some of that history, some of that opening up and solidarity <coughs> around questions of identity that underlay subsequent developments, including the non-racial policy of the ANC and the extraordinary transition to South African democracy in 1994. Mandela's story is well known. Fisher's not quite as much, though I've done what I can to remedy that. His story is worth recalling in some of its key outlines, for it extends the theme I'm beginning to develop here. As a white man, and a particular kind of white man, Fisher was an unusual candidate to be a member of a liberation movement. He was born into one of the most eminent of Afrikaner nationalist families. His grandfather had been a member of the Executive Council of the Boer Republic of the Orange Free State, during the lead-up to the Anglo-Boer War of 1899 to 1902. After the war, he was the first and only Prime Minister of the Orange River Colony, and when the Union of South Africa was formed in 1910, he was appointed a Cabinet Minister. Bram Fisher's father, like his grandfather and like Bram himself, was a lawyer and became Judge President of the Orange Free State. Bram himself seemed destined for greatness. Charismatic and charming, people said of him, that he would become either Chief Justice of South Africa or Prime Minister, depending on his inclination. Yet, his inclinations took him elsewhere. As a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford, he traveled on the European continent and saw at first hand the rise of fascism and Nazism. In 1932, he traveled to the Soviet Union. When he returned to Johannesburg to take up law, he joined liberal movements, and then by some time in the early 1940s, he joined the Communist Party, together with his wife, Molly Fisher. It was an unlikely shift, among the most unlikely. There were other whites who joined the Communist Party, or alternative left movements. Some of them were Jewish refugees from the Russian Empire or from fascist Europe, and there one could see a logical, if particular, trajectory emerging from the politics and realities of the time. But an Afrikaner nationalist, that was different. And yet, it was not altogether different. For Bram Fischer's family had fought the British Empire. They were anti-imperialist, and someone of Bram's imagination was able to link Afrikaner anti-imperialism with the anti-imperialism of socialism. Similarly, he had witnessed at first hand in Europe the overwhelming need to oppose fascism wherever it was found, a new lens on his South African environment. In this way, and this was the key corollary, he came to understand that to identify himself as a South African, and the word Afrikaner means African in Afrikaans, he had to identify himself with all of South Africa's people, making the word come into its full significance. In an intriguing paradox, it did not mean that he surrendered his identity as an Afrikaner. Rather, it was because he felt a particular responsibility as an Afrikaner that he joined the liberation movement. It was the only place of non-contradiction he could inhabit in his sense of self. Now, there are obvious ironies here, 
and one could delineate them regarding the history of communism, including the repressive realities of Stalinism. How could someone who favored, favored liberation in South Africa join a movement responsible for its own oppressions in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe? Yet in Fisher's life, and particularly in the formative years of his political imagination and loyalties, these things made sense. The Communist Party was one of the very few non-racial groupings in South Africa, and certainly it was the largest. It was open to black membership and had black leaders. Here the local joined with the global in one seamless orientation, the national with the international. Here Brahm and Molly Fisher could find a home, a new way of being South African, consonant with a way of being in the world. And so at the edges of their identity, they opened themselves up. They made contact with others. Their sense of who they were and who they could be was transformed. Across the open and often treacherous space of the South African landscape, they were approaching someone such as Nelson Mandela, just as he, in his way, was approaching them. The result was a new kind of language, a new syntax made of these connections and contiguities, these forms of expression. A new grammar of identity was being fashioned in South Africa. It is easy to underestimate the difficulties of a new language in this form as in any other. For one thing, if a Mandela and a Fisher approach one another, there is no easy symmetry in their doing so, nor is the terrain across which they approach in any sense level. There are differences in life experience and privilege, the internalized realities of racial authority and subjection, the easy assumption of resources, and the desperate lack of them. In such circumstances, there is always the question of who gives voice to what and who speaks for whom. Check your baggage at the door, not because you leave it behind, but more importantly, because you bring it with you, especially when you think you've left it behind. The philosopher Emmanuel Levinas, giving these issues theoretical form, talks of what he calls differences in height when two people or more approach one another across the boundaries of their connection. The problem is not only horizontal, how to get across that space, but vertical, how to do so with a sense of the power differentials involved and the new orientations that must result. At the least in the South African context, it meant what the poet Mangani Wali Soroti pointed out some 30 years later. White people are white people, they must learn to listen. Black people are black people, they must learn to talk. For someone such as Fisher, it would have meant, even as he committed himself wholeheartedly to the cause of liberation, understanding that he must follow as well as lead, speak but not speak for, recognize the often unconscious shape and consequent limits of his authority. That is what it takes sometimes to speak a language, the language of one's language, the language within one's language, well. It takes delicacy, respect, tact, understanding. It is only this that can bring a new vision and version of what true reciprocity can mean. My focus in this talk is on identity, that complex reality each of us has but no one fully understands. It is like the eye in the mirror, reflected differently in the light of every day, reversed every time we look at it. As for the identity in time, this is even more of a mystery and challenge, particularly in circumstances of inequality and consequent responsibility. Yet it is at the same time the most hopeful of our possibilities if we recognize its capacities for morphology within the course of a life. Mandela and others like him, Walter Susulu, Oliver Tambo, Robert Sabukwe, Lillian Ngoyi, Yusuf Dadu, Ram Fisher, Joe Slovo, <coughs> Ruth First, and many more. These were South Africa's great generation who saw their country through with dignity and determination from oppression to democracy. Some of them did not survive to see it, but these were people who lived the boundary in their lives. They were transitional in every, including the best sense, making their way from one time towards another. They were also, in a certain regard, the classic generation, living in a classic era of oppression, when lines were relatively clear, when objectives seemed fairly certain. Their tale of identity difficult as it was, accordingly also had a certain clarity and definition. South Africa belongs to all who live in her, black and white. These opening words from the ANC Freedom Charter of 1953 
provided the map and its pathways. It was compass and destination <coughs> all in one. But what happens when it is not clear what it means to belong? How does a country belong to all? What happens when the map has changed and the road still seems difficult, when the heights one has scaled bring up the view only of more distant horizons and an uncertain road towards them? What happens to our understanding of identity, of who we are along the way? Is there some way in which our unfolding identity can help define the path we are on, and even in the end, the destination towards which we aim? The question itself has many routes to follow, many ways of thinking about it. It is a truism that whatever one writes is in some sense autobiography. But beneath the truism is something more profound. That beneath one searches is a persistence that might be called simply obsessional, were it not justified by more meaningful dimensions. Speaking somewhat reflectively now, and reflexively, I can say that my own searches in my professional life, my way forward, has been a continual way of going back, to derive my topics from the world from which I came, to see addressing them, being answerable to them, both as an obligation and a way forward. For there is something here about accountability, being accountable, giving account, turning experience into something that counts. In that regard, I've written criticism on South African literature, I've tried my hand at biography of a South African political figure, and I've returned to criticism in the transnational arena. Underlying it all, the figure in the carpet, a la Henry James, is the question of identity, of how emerging from within a broken world, we might approach one another to make something more just and more human of it. The question came from the place of my birth, and it has followed me here. You teach where you are, you write where you are, there is always something that needs to be done. I've looked from South Africa to the world, now I look from elsewhere in the world towards South Africa. The challenge of identity is not only my topic, it is my own challenge, subject and object inseparable, though they may be explored in different ways. So, this section of the, of the talk is called The State of Exception. Nowadays, the idea of a state of exception comes to us from Carl Schmitt via Giorgio Agambe. It is that state of emergency beyond the normal rules of society, which in the last resort define the nature of sovereignty and underwrites the so-called normal rules themselves. This is not a bad description of South Africa under apartheid, where the normal was so bound up in the abnormal regarding laws, ethics, justice, the daily practices of life, that it was impossible to tell them apart the exception from the ordinary. One aspect of the work of fiction in such a setting was to tell that story of intermingling between the normal and abnormal, the emergent and the emergency, the torture chamber and other more recognizable forms of intimacy. I want to keep this notion of exception in mind and to link it via a kind of reverse angle with a more everyday version of its definition. But during the era of apartheid, South Africa was often regarded as a state of exception, an exceptional state, in other words, that did not follow the normal rules, especially those rules as established in the aftermath of the Second World War, when racism of the most virulent kind had seemingly been outlawed and delegitimized in every way. And yet I want to argue differently. South Africa was not the exception to the state of the world, but its extension and microcosm, or at least one of its microcosms. But the truth is, the rest of the world was not set apart from apartheid, much as it might have spurned it. It may be that responsibility has its own calculus. Not everyone is equally responsible for everything. And yet everyone is involved, whether they like to think so or not. This was certainly true of the global dispensation during the apartheid era. At the same time as the US and UK condemned South Africa at the United Nations, they did very well out of its economy, its gold and diamonds. They supported South Africa as an anti-communist bulwark in Africa in the context of the Cold War. W.E.B. Du Bois's color line, which he had defined as the problem of the 20th century, applied as much in the march from Selma to Montgomery in 1965 as it did in the Sharpeville Massacre of 1960. 
It was British-made tanks and trucks that rolled into the black townships of Johannesburg, Cato Manor, or Cape Town. More to the point, the form of racial capitalism honed and refined in South Africa had everything to do with the larger shape of the world, its imperial and colonial legacies, its varied forms of political, economic, cultural, racial, and gender supremacies. And therefore, the state of exception was not exceptional to the world, but one of its most extreme forms of expression. Exceptions in this sense have their uses, not least analytic and conceptual. If, as Blake said, one can see the world in a grain of sand, here, too, one can read off from the micro to the macro, from the microcosm to the macrocosm. As Jean and John Komarov have argued, the global north and south are not separated from one another, but dialectically related, mutually informing. In that regard, even under apartheid, South Africa was not the exception, but the mirror to the world, where it could see its own concentrated <coughs> reflection. One could look from South Africa to the world, as one could look from the world to South Africa. What could we learn there? What were we able and unable to see? What can we see now as we gaze, multiply located, in both directions? I want to consider some of these questions by thinking about works of fiction, both in the South African setting and elsewhere. Implicit in everything I'll be saying here is that the work of fiction is not just a way of denoting a novel or a short story, or in the wider sense, a play or a film. Rather, I would make the case that fiction does serious work for us, and the work that it has to do is the work of fiction. Indeed, I'm enough of a Darwinist to believe that if fiction did not do something important for us, it would have died out long ago. <laughs> that work is not simply the work of diversion, of entertainment. <coughs> Rather, if we want to twist etymology for a moment, its diversion, its turning from, is a diversion, a doubled version, cut aslant to the world, in which both the normalcy and abnormalcy of the world comes to light, the uncanny reality we inhabit. Equally, fiction, that most ethereal and insubstantial of forms, lying as it does on the border between inside and outside, the conscious and the unconscious, the said and the unsayable, is in its own way a compass. To use a phrase I once applied to the work of Nadine Gordimer, it gives us a history from the inside, not only a history of the present in the form Jean and John Komarov posed in their recent discussion here at UMass, but also a sense of what it is like to be inside the problem of history, with no outside or elsewhere from which to view it. In that sense, with its own wisdoms and double versions, it provides its own inner and outer maps of who and where we are, its own forms of navigation across our broken and connected world, whether in South Africa or elsewhere. Fiction, it is worth saying, is in some respects more complicated than politics its territory more problematic. Sometimes it provides a mapping as counterpart to the political, sometimes as competition to the political, which does not make it any less significant. From that point of view, we can see that people such as Mandela and Fisher may have solved the question of identity in their own lives or modeled it in a new way. But beneath that, fiction tells a story of what the process of such a solution is like or what remains unresolved in the undercurrents of the overtly political domain. These are undercurrents otherwise unseen, but crucial to our more visible movements within and through the world. Not least, fiction explores the unresolved in what appear to be our resolutions. To that extent, it relays the degree to which our story is always an unfolding narrative. Fiction takes the boundary between people, between peoples, between the self and itself as the space of navigation. And among other things, what is encountered there is the still unresolved, unfolding story of who we are and what we might become. Okay, section called The Boundary and Identity in South Africa, where I'll be looking at some, some works in a little more detail. I want to take those concepts of the boundary and identity and consider them through the lens of fiction as we look from South Africa to the world and back again. Boundaries have been intrinsic to the South African story at least since the first Dutch settlers landed in the Cape in 1652 and constructed a hedge to keep out the indigenous inhabitants they found there. Kind of symbolic first move. You know. 
Uh, sometime later, they built a fort, otherwise known as the castle in Cape Town, which, as W.G. Zabelt reminds us indirectly in his novel o Austerlitz, would have been the equivalent of the many star-shaped fortresses found in Europe in the 17th and 18th centuries. Still later in South Africa, boundaries became those of <coughs> frontiers and segregation and pass laws and walls and forced removals and barbed wire and police cells and the everyday limits of what the poet Ingrid Jonker in her poignant phrase called the locations of the cordoned heart. And it's true that boundaries have walled off identities in South Africa and, and as elsewhere. Yet what I want to suggest is that contrary to first impressions, boundaries are not the barrier to meaning or to an unfolding identity, but rather their provocation, even their precondition. Without boundaries, without spaces, Meaning would not cross from one person to another, from one self towards another, or in transition within the self from one form of being towards another. This is perhaps something that goes back to our earliest beginnings, where meaning and identity and movement were connected. The human species emerged from Africa to inhabit the planet, but the problem of navigation, who we are in the world, has not been solved. As I suggested in my book, The Grammar of Identity, the question is not whether boundaries should exist, because they do, they always do. The question is how we understand boundaries and therefore what kinds of boundaries we construct. Can we imagine into being the kinds of boundaries that facilitate meaning and encounter and crossing? Can we fashion transitive rather than intransitive boundaries as Mandela and Fisher did when they approached one another? South African scholars and critics have paid quite a bit of attention to the boundary as almost the archetypal topos of its literary imagination, the primary feature of its textual landscape. For Leon de Kock, there is the seam, a place of recurring conjunction marked by the violence of its stitching, a seam that always gets reworked. Uh, for Sarah Nuttall, the concept is that of entanglement, explaining how black and white lives are inextricably bound up with one another. For myself, there is the nature of the boundary as a space of crossing, transition in both space and time, with all its attendant vertigo, uncanny hauntings, anxieties, and commitments. I think overall it may be true that there is less anxiety over the boundary in black writing as compared to white, that is, if we understand anxiety to be linked to questions of guilt, repression, and haunting. But it is there nonetheless, and the obvious point is worth making that black South Africans under apartheid live the boundary every day of their lives. In either form, the question of the boundary and what it means for identity has been present in South African literature from the start. So it is impossible in the course of a presentation such as this to give anything like a full overview. Still, I want to suggest by dipping into the work of several writers how far the question of the boundary has prompted the question of identity in South African writing. So, for example, the Nobel Prize winner Nadine Gordimer has been drawn to the open space, often between city and country, as the archetypal setting in which the question, and sometimes crisis, of identity is provoked. In one of her very earliest short stories, entitled Is There Nowhere Else Where We Can Meet, a young woman on the edge of town is approached by a ragged black figure coming towards her. Everything about the scene suggests violence, and possibly sexual violence, but all the black man wants is the young woman's purse, and after surrendering it, she leaves, uncertain as to whether it was fear or desire that compelled her, a subconscious tangle at once racial and sexual in her perplexed sense of self. In Gordimer's great novel, The Conservationist, 1974, it is on a mind dump between farm and country that its central character, Mayron, an industrialist turned faux farmer, that's where he meets his comeuppance, confronting at last the limits of his authority and his hold on the land. In July's People, 1981, the action takes place in a moment of transition, the prophetic moment of revolutionary climax and chaos itself, as a white family hides out in the village of their former servant, July. Here the boundary is one of both space and time, and how emblematic that ultimately its central character, central white character, Maureen, runs towards a river which she crosses, abandoning her family, not knowing whether she is headed for death or life. 
But in this highly controversial ending, my reading is that the, is that the river is Maureen's future, with the self, herself, will find itself utterly translated, an apocalyptic vision for an apocalyptic time. In Gautama's post-apartheid novel, The Pickup, from 2001, the boundary is the desert in an unnamed Arab country. This is where Julie, the young white South African woman who has married an Arab man, will wait for him as he heads off into empire to the United States where he wants to make it in the world. The novel brings my topics together. Gordima is looking from South Africa to the world. She is looking from the world to South Africa. The contact zones and boundaries of identity not only mirror one another from local to global, but are inextricably related. Let us reflect for a moment on what this means. What is it that not only the story, but the structure of identity in South Africa can reflect for the world? There are philosophical issues here. For one thing, there, there is the reality of connection. That selfhood for one is fundamentally related to selfhood for the other. That each must be resolved together. That my freedom is linked to your freedom. A new version of Hegel's master-slave dialectic. There is the challenge of what I would call contiguity that we are linked by what divides us. For this too is the secret of the boundary, that divi what, what divides also connects, and what connects all too often divides. There is the question of what the Canadian writer Anne Michaels calls simultaneity, that at every moment in our present tense, atrocities are taking place from which, if we are honest, we cannot separate ourselves. There is what Mark Sanders has called in the South African setting, complicity, the understanding of how the unit of self is caught up in the system which contains it, and vice versa. In South Africa, this has been a problem not only for whites, an essential component of answerability from which few were able to escape, but even as Mark Sanders shows, for black South Africans. Steve Biko, the great black consciousness leader, argued that until blacks took responsibility for their own oppression by liberating, in the first instance, their minds, they too were complicit in the conditions of their own oppression. The implications for this in the global setting are as straightforward as they are immense. Wealth in the US or Europe or China is intrinsically connected with poverty elsewhere, whether that elsewhere is in the US or Europe or China. Wealth may not be the way out of poverty, in other words, it may be its cause. From a different direction, this underlying <coughs> philosophy of connectivity is one we can approach from within black South African culture itself through the concept of Ubuntu, which my friend and colleague Mzama Mangaliso has written about. A person is a person because of and through other people. I would hazard a bet that almost no one who grew up in South Africa was unaffected by this principle, whether consciously or unconsciously, by way of acknowledgement or denial or some mixture of the two. That the overarching morality of our lives is connected with the lives of others. Hence the problem of responsibility, of accountability, which never goes away in a perpetually unfolding story of the self, its implications, its divisions, and its linkages. James Kutsia, in his masterpiece, Waiting for the Barbarians, explores other implications of a system out of balance. Understanding, too, a great Kutsian theme the tension between a self that wishes to be out of history and the self that recognizes just how situated in history it is. The focus of this exploration in the novel is its narrator, the magistrate, the agent of empire whose brutality he would like to soften or even oppose. The magistrate must recognize that under empire, law, the very system that defines his being as a magistrate, may not be the path out of injustice, but the very form of its enactment yet another chilling reminder. The novel is not set in any recognizable time and place. Instead, it unfolds on the outposts of an unnamed empire on its frontier. Again, in such a setting, South Africa and the world's history of various empires are connected. The boundary and identity a key conjunction. In the topography of the novel, the magistrate's habitation is the fort, the walled environment. Beyond that are the marshes, and beyond that, the desert, where the barbarians live. Kutsia has taken his title from Kavafi's poem, Waiting for the Barbarians, in which the barbarians are expected but never arrive, which is perplexing to empire. 
For as Kavaki writes, they were those people, a kind of solution. The barbarian is a solution for empire because he solves the problem of being and identity. If you know who the barbarian is, you know who you are, which is what empire needs in order to define itself. Beyond its walls, what empire needs is an enemy. Within, what it wants is a regime which we might call, with a sense for all the nuances of the word, indifference, a zone of uniformity, lack of concern, predictability. How then do you become different in that zone? How do you oppose the system that underwrites your being, even your authority, to oppose it? How do we even see under empire? In a far-reaching investigation in the novel, it becomes clear that empire is an encompassing domain of perception and understanding that smudges the very optics of our vision like a finger raked across our retinas. The story of fiction here is not directly a political story, but I think we'd be foolish not to understand how far it, un how far it examines the political foundations of our times. The world of waiting for the barbarians is not quite our world, but at some haunting level, it is our world too, no matter where we are, no matter which regimes we are part of and feel dissident or dissonant from. How do some of these questions around boundaries and identity appear in the work of black South African writers? Certainly, there's been a recognition of fragility, as in Soroti's poem, City Johannesburg, where he writes of the capacity of an oppressive system to invade the body and the mind. I can feel your roots anchoring your might, my feebleness, in my flesh, in my mind, in my blood. Similarly, the reverie sections of Eski and Pahleli's autobiography, Down Second Avenue, present a complex depiction of black subjectivity under the weight of apartheid. But at the same time, other possibilities exist in the story of identity, and I would like to explore some of them in the work of, South Afri of one of South Africa's foremost writers and thinkers, Njabulo Ndebele. It was Ndebele who, to my mind, offered one of the most nuanced and persuasive accounts of the politicality of fiction in the South African context. Arguing against what he saw as a generation of protest writers whose work operated at the level of surface symbols of good and evil, Ndebele insisted that the job of the writer was to develop, a form of inter to develop forms of interiority that belied the pre-assigned identities conferred on blacks by apartheid. Instead of the work of fiction as product, with all its messages ne neatly wrapped up for delivery, Ndebele drew attention to the story as process, involving the reader as well as the writer in discovering previously unacknowledged di dimensions of reality. The politics of fiction was neither a simulacrum nor reproduction of a preordained discourse of the political, but it had things to teach about the political that the political universe needed to hear. In this way, in the forms of thought and understanding it encouraged, in the community it generated between writers and readers, it was an essentially democratic form. We can see some of this at work in Indabelli's superb collection, Fools and Other Stories. For my purposes, I'll focus on just two stories and a few main points. To begin with, the collection as a whole is notable for one unmissable reality. There are virtually no white characters in it. In Ndebele's fictional world, then, identity is a problem not outside, but within the black community for its inhabitants and members. The volume's opening story is called The Test, and all it involves is the question of whether the protagonist, Torba, out playing soccer with a group of boys, will run home in the rain against what he knows will be the disapproval of his mother. The boys all dare one another until Torba runs. Features to focus on, he leaps out beyond the wall of the veranda where he and the boys are sheltering, and he disobeys his mother. Identity is discovered in transgressing the boundary, crossing it in physical, moral, and existential ways. Simple enough, but important. The other story is the closing one, and it's, and it's the title piece in the volume, Fools. Here the protagonist and narrator, Zamani, is a fallen man, a teacher who cheats on his wife, is habitually drunk, and once raped one of his students worth remembering, we should remember this, teacher and cheetah are anagrams of one another. <laughs> the question obviously arises, why would Indebele choose such a terrible character, not least in the context of apartheid? Surely this is the opposite of solidarity writing. 
the optimistic construction of identity in opposition to oppression. But Indebelli knows something else. He shows something else. How through frustration and stunted possibilities, oppression can be internalized and even recreated within the black community. Paradoxically, he also shows the humanity of his teacher figure, for he is, within the conditions of his disgrace, a complex man. And finally, he shows this figure standing up to a white man, one of those very few in the collection, and equally importantly, perhaps taking on responsibility in relation to his wife, though some doubts remain even there. What Indebelli has shown us is identity as process, a continual process, even and perhaps especially within the degraded and broken reality Zamani inhabits. Indebelli, strongly influenced as it happens by Walter Benjamin's essay, The Storyteller, what might have taken one of Benjamin's key formulations as his own regarding the counsel or wisdom to be gleaned from a story. After all, Benjamin reminds us, counsel is less an answer to a question than a proposal concerning the continuation of a story which is just unfolding. We are inside the story we tell. In South Africa, as elsewhere, the story of our identity is an unfolding process, even when, when governed by conditions of disgrace, whether personal or collective. What else do we see in these works, in this work, these writings by Gordima Kutsia and Indebelli? We see at the least that some of the key questions around identity take place not at its core, but at its edges, where we encounter difference, our transitions across both space and time, whether in undefined open territory, across the wall, or outside the fortress. Or perhaps more precisely, we see that core is not insulated from edge, but is dialectically related to it. Identity is discovered not in retreat to the center, but by heading out towards the boundary. If we want to find out who we are at the core, let us see how we treat people on or at the edge, or how we deal with edges and boundaries within ourselves, the potential for difference and discovery inside us. In the end, periphery and center are not separable, but intrinsically related. That is where the existential freight is, the moral questions that check us for worth, some of the deepest ethical problems we face, as well as the prospects for liberation in our own lives. This has been true and remains true, not only in South Africa, but here in the USA, in Ireland, in Israel and Palestine, everywhere. Okay, a section called Writing Identity Elsewhere. I want to underline some of the points I've been making um, about South Africa and its relation to the world by thinking briefly about two writers from elsewhere, Carol Phillips and W.G. Zabelt. Both show that the questions I've been thinking about are not purely South African, and they take the story in other directions as well. <coughs> Carol Phillips is a writer who has crossed serious amounts of space in his own life. Born in St. Kitts in the West Indies, taken to England at the age of three months, growing up in Leeds, winning a scholarship against the odds to Oxford University, now living in the United States, he knows about periphery and center, core and edge, and the complex combinatorials that make up identity more broadly in the world. Not least, as someone of Afro-Caribbean descent, he also discovered at a certain point in his life that he had a Jewish grandfather. Unsurprisingly, perhaps, his writing, both fiction and non-fiction, insistently crosses geography. His searching collection of essays, A New World Order, is divided into four sections, the United States, Africa, the Caribbean, Britain. In the final essay of that volume, Phillips confesses his wish when he dies to have his ashes scattered in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean at a point equidistant between Britain, Africa, and North America, the place that he calls my Atlantic home. His fiction is similarly insistent, notoriously fragmented not only in space but in time. Indeed, many of his characters crossing space are time migrants as well because they appear to have crossed from one time to another in layers of the pre-modern, the modern, and the post-modern. So in one of his extraordinary novels, The Nature of Blood, four discernible major narratives are interlaced without much initial differentiation. We have the story of Eva, a Jewish Holocaust survivor. There is an account of a small town named Porto Bufole near Venice where a blood libel execution of a group of Jews takes place in the 15th century. Then we are back in Venice, but in the 16th century for the first person narrative of Othello, a figure 
who has magnetized Phillips as the first great literary immigrant from Africa in Europe. Then there is Eva's uncle Stefan, making his new home in Israel, where his life is briefly threaded with that of a woman he comes across, a Jewish Ethiopian migrant named Malka. What are we to say about all of this? On the one hand, the model is that of constellation. These histories and identities are constellated across time and space. We as readers make our shapes between and across them as we might draw constellations through the depths of the night sky. On the other hand, as I pointed out in the grammar of identity, these narratives create a remarkable associative chain of identity. As one story hands off to another, we go from a German Jew, Eva, to Jewish Venetians in Porto Bufole, to a Venetian African, Othello, to an African Jew, Malka. It's a chain of identity marked by its transitions, its gaps, its continuities, its fractures, just as identity is in the world today. Other works of fiction by Phillips show equally momentous crossings of space and time. In his novel, A Distant Shore, he shows how the life of an African migrant and an alienated white Englishwoman cut across one another, glancingly and ultimately tragically. Their story tells of the inner fragmentation and uncanny nature of national space in Britain, taking apart forever, perhaps, Benedict Anderson's notion of a singular imagined community. Our challenges, both within nations and across them, go much deeper and more alarmingly than that. The work of W.G. Zabolt moves me not only because he's a great writer who invented his own forms, but also because he has taken on the question of accountability. For one thing, he confronts the enormous significance of simultaneity. He talks of his birth in a small village in Bavaria in May 1944. Then you discover it was the same month when Kafka's sister was deported to Auschwitz. For Zebalt, accountability and complicity can apply not only in the present, but even retroactively across time, so that we can be accountable for the crimes committed before we were born. That is, so long as we do not confront their after effects in the world we now inhabit. Even then, one suspects in Zebalt's universe, full accountability might never be possible. Hence, his endless searches, his pilgrimages through time and space in a work such as The Rings of Saturn, where every last feature he discovers on a walking tour along the coast of England is connected with far-reaching global histories of depreda depredation and atrocity, the <coughs> ultimate of which is the Holocaust. For Zebald, as I suggest in The Grammar of Identity, the Holocaust is like the Big Bang of our universe. Its imprint and traces visible everywhere you look the thrumming background radiation to everything we are. For a German writer to confront this is extraordinarily important, and searching out its implications is endless for Zebald. From Germany to the world, one might say. From the world to Germany. So, in Zebald's great work, Austerlitz, the eponymous, the eponymous character Austerlitz tells the narrator how he and a school friend had gone flying, quote, until the last gleam of light was extinguished on the horizons of the Western world. That is how far we have to search too in our own horizons of the Western world. But those horizons are embedded within us, no matter where we come from. Okay, and to your relief, I'm sure, final and concluding section called Back Home. What does the story look like now in South Africa? We've gone from the Rainbow Nation, the miracle of 1994, a much more complex and troubled set of realities. South Africa has been the AIDS capital of the world. It has and continues to be one of the rape capitals of the world. Unemployment runs at around 25%. Crime and violence, having reached epic highs, have subsided somewhat. South Africa has the best constitution in the world. Sorry to tell you this, but it's true. <laughs> uh, but it also suffers terribly from corruption and incipient threats against freedom of speech. In all this, the writers have gone on writing, the filmmakers making films, the musicians making music. In the universe of fiction, we hear new voices and new realities. Ivan Vladislavich walks the violent geography of Johannesburg, its walls and gateways, in portrait with keys. Uh, in a novel called The Heart, Marlene van Niekerk writes with stunning beauty of a woman dying of ALS on a farm and her entangled relationship with her servant, a woman of mixed race. Zoe Wickham has gone from her feminist and postmodern consideration of mixed race identity 
in a collection of short stories called You Can't Get Lost in Cape Town to post-apartheid considerations of identity in playing in the light. In a novel called Coconut, a young writer called Kopana Matwa explores the challenges of new urban conglomerations of identity for young black women. Nick and Flongo irreverently explores the uproarious improvisational nature of selfhood for his young male protagonist in a novel entitled After Tears. I want to leave you, however, with two impressions, two images in balance as we look from South Africa to the world. The first, tragically, comes from Marikana, a platinum mine to the west of Johannesburg, where in August this year the miners went on strike and a massacre took place as the police opened fire. 34 were killed and 78 wounded. It seemed that the days of apartheid had risen once more, the massacre at Sharpeville enacted once again. Platinum is a commodity that by its very nature links South Africa with the world, with a globalized economy. The mining company that owns Marikana is based in London, as its name Lonman suggests. Prominent black South African figures sit on its board, including a former leader of the National Union of Mine Workers, Cyril Ramaphosa. I want to play you some audio of a piece of music that came out almost immediately in response to the massacre. You won't get all the words. Don't worry about that. If you listen, you'll understand everything. It's a piece of music called Bloodshed of the Innocents, <coughs> and it's recorded by a group called Sounds of the South. So this is about two-minute extract. You can get it. So when I first heard that, I was um, sort of overwhelmed. It's a very powerful piece of music, and it came out within two weeks of, of, of the massacre. And it's, um, you, don't have to, you don't even have to know too much about South Africa, but this is a piece that could have come from the apartheid era, for sure. It sounds the same. Uh, fight the oppression because the system is killing us. The words are, are very evocative, very familiar. Where is that system killing us? In South Africa, in the world, where? What does this mean for South Africa? What does it mean for our sense of who we are now? The story of identity for our times has become a shadowed story. The second image, however, comes from, from a novel by a young writer named Kay Selodoka, who tragically killed himself in 2005. Doka's first novel, 13 Cents, was the story of a young black boy growing up rough on the streets of Cape Town. His second, an unusual and sometimes disturbing work called The Quiet Violence of Dreams, concerns a young man named Chepo, university educated, who also lives a marginalized life. He's been hospitalized for psychosis. He suffers brutal sexual violence. He comes to work as a prostitute in a male escort establishment in Cape Town. 
where he finds a form of brotherhood. At the end of the novel, though, he returns to Johannesburg, where he works in a home for homeless children. There, in Hillbrow, he lives among the Makwerikweri, the name given to foreign Africans at a time in South Africa of violent xenophobia. But for Chepo, much of whose life has been one of alienation, the vision is different. I believe in people, in humankind, in personhood. In Hillbrow, I live with foreigners, illegal and legal immigrants, what black South Africans call Makwerikweri with derogatory and defiant arrogance. I feel at home with them because they're trying to find a home in our country. They are so fragile, so cultured and beautiful, our foreign guests. In their eyes, I feel at home. I see Africa. Black South Africans were once treated as foreigners in their own land. Here, in the quiet violence of dreams, welcoming the foreigner is a way of being at home. Which will be the story of identity for our time? Americana, xenophobia? Mandela and Fisher solved the problem in their way, and there is indeed a link with that earlier, earlier era, which I think is more than incidental. For the lawyer now representing some of the Marikana families at the Commission of Inquiry into the massacre is none other than George Bezos, who took me to see Nelson Mandela on that Saturday in 1991. George is based at the Legal Resources Center in Bram Fisher House in Johannesburg. But I want to focus less on the past than on these two stories in the present. They are not so much different options as indissolubly linked. A massacre such as Marikana occurs when we treat someone anyone as the foreigner, the alien in our midst. But in acknowledging and welcoming the foreigner as ourselves, recognizing the foreigner in every single one of us, providing a home for all, we may find that we too are at home. This is what Giorgio Agamben calls the being in exodus of the citizen. And if I may interpolate just a little, I think he means that we're always on the verge, no matter where we are, of leaving empire always on the verge of finding exodus within ourselves and therefore recognizing that <coughs> exodus in others, finding a form of what may become liberation. We have to go out to the edges of our being to find what is at the core. In South Africa, in the world, we are the ones who will decide the story of identity for our times. Thank you very much. Thank you.